So uh, good afternoon and uh, welcome to today's uh, lecture in the uh, introduction to software technology. Uh, last time we, we spent quite some time on, on, on uh, software modeling, the way we, we create models to, to represent different aspects, um, different uh, uh, artifacts that we, we use to communicate within the, the uh, team. Uh, with our stakeholders, uh, like customers and so on. Uh, today, we'll continue to uh, look at one specific uh, activity, uh, the requirements activity, and, and how we can model uh, what kind of support uh, we can get from, from uh, the UML for, for modeling uh, the requirements. The, the, Lecture will well. We will not uh, explore the all the possibilities in UML. It will be a cursory uh, uh, lecture in the sense that we will uh, briefly go through the the top level behavioral uh, diagrams, uh, just so that you guys can can get a first look at the the opportunities and and something that has a, a rather. Uh, uh, straightforward application. So, uh, software development, well, the connection to, to, to problem solving and, and, well, understanding the problem uh, is, well, in software development, re uh, uh, in software development it's, it's uh, referred to as, as, well, requirements, requirements engineering. And uh, if we, uh, well, consider, well, understanding a problem, that involves a number of, 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 of sub-activities. One is to, to uh, uh, elicit or collect information about the, the uh, problem so that we can work, process that information in a way that we can, we can specify the problem, discuss it with our stakeholders, and at the end of the day, uh, use it as the basis for, for continued activities in our project. So, design, implementation, and testing. And uh, understanding a problem, whoops, that was, uh, is, is, extremely important in, in, in all, in any uh, development project. And it's, it's, it's pretty obvious that if we don't have a shared understanding, not just within the development team, but also share an understanding with the other stakeholders, we will not end up in this, you know, the win-win situation where we have happy customers, happy developers, everyone is happy. So, so there are different, well, approaches for, for how to do this, but I would say that, that the, the, the iterative approach that I try to visualize on this slide is, is that in fact the only one that works. It's the only one that works because we're not targeting really simple projects like, well, that can be explained just by one sentence. Uh, we're considering projects that involves several different users, for instance, or other stakeholders. And, and it means that, well, just a share amount of information we, we must process in order to, to, to get the points of views from all these people is, is so big that, that, well, it needs some processing before we can, can what is it, be able to, to digest it. And, and when it's about information, when it's about communication, we all know that, well, communication is difficult. And here we will combine written sources with, well, we talk to people, we study existing systems and so on. But at the end of the day, it's about interpreting this information. 
And I think that from, from, from uh, your own studies, for instance, you know, the assignments you get, for instance, they, they contain a, a problem statement. You are expected to do this. And even if it's just, well, five, six sentences, if you're 50 students, I can almost promise you that there will be at least 40 different interpretations of these five, six sentences. Why is that? Well, that's the inherent communication problem. It is extremely difficult to describe some, something to a degree that there are no room for interpretation. There is no room for interpretation, and that's what we're striving for. So, what I suggest in this slide is, is, is the only alternative that I see, and that is that we work iteratively together with the stakeholders, and it's us on, on the left-hand side here uh, with a black shirt. We start with communicating with the stakeholders, elicit information, information that we process. We come up with a proposal. This is our understanding of the problem. And then you take that understanding back to the stakeholders and say, hey, have a look at this. You validate your problem description uh, together with them. You will get feedback. Feedback that you take back, do a little bit more work, improve, come back to the stakeholders. So, with this process, users and other stakeholders will feel that they are involved. You care for their uh, needs. Which means by that, okay, they will be much more uh, understanding to your uh, ideas, what you suggest, compared to if you didn't involve them. So, here we have requirements. And we have this guy standing in front of the mirror and what I want to depict with this picture here is, is the fact that there are different types of requirements. So apart from, from this, this work where you discuss with, with stakeholders like users and so on, uh, there are also other types of requirements. And these requirements are not necessarily something you get from the end user. There can be others, other stakeholders, other parties that has an interest in the project that, that, gives you, that will give you these uh, requirements. A very simple distinction here is, is between external and internal qualities, or internal uh, uh, requirements. Uh, external requirements are requirements where you can ask the end user if they think that this requirement has been met by the product or not. So, so for instance, the, the functionality of an application. You can ask the customer, do you think that this functionality is in the product or not? Yes or no? Compare that to an internal requirement an internal product requirement that has to do with the uh, ability to, to maintain the product, to maintain the source code. That's not something that you can go to the customer and ask. If, do you think that this product is easy to maintain? They have no clue. For that, you have to go to the developers. So, there are requirement that come, requirements that come from, from usage of the product, and there are also requirements that, well, impose constraints on how the product is being developed. So, a simple requirements engineering process starts with, and this is like for, for each and every iteration in, 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 in the, the, the uh, 
the schematic process you, you saw a couple of slides back, you start with eliciting information. And you start with like a wish list. And look at additional documentation, you can look at uh, existing systems, so on and so forth. But if you go out and ask, and this depends on the type of product you're developing, of course, you can compare, uh, well, you're, if you're developing a product for, for a mass market, something that will be sold, that you will try to sell off the shelf, or a system where you have one customer. You can see that how you deal with the information elicitation here uh, will, will be different if you talk about a single customer or a market. So, so you cannot apply, uh, employ the same uh, strategies if, if, if uh, you, you do something for the market or if you do it for the, for the, for the single customer. Say that you go out and talk to, to, to some customer representatives, uh, different potential users of this system, 15, and ask them for uh, their wish list. You think you will get the same list? No. There will be, of course, some items on the lists that are the same or similar, uh, but there will also be some that are unique or just uh, on a few a subset of the list. And there could also be requirements that, that will go in completely different directions because you're talking to individuals and they will not say something for the good of the organization, they will let you know something for the good of them, their own, for their own situation. So a subjective statement. So uh, what you have to do now with this information is to, is to start figuring out, well, what are the requirements here? Because the statements on a wish list wish on the wish lists are not requirements it's something else so you must start processing here trying to figure out what is concerned with functionality in this information what is concerned with functionality what is concerned with quality of this functionality do you have any other process constraints that you can identify in, 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 in this information that you have, have collected? So you will not get requirements from your customer. You will get something that you need to process and turn into requirements. For instance, if you have similar requirements or similar uh, uh, statements on, on the wish list, okay, uh, they can still be different. So you need to, to align them and make these statements into a single requirement for the system. If you have competing statements, say that one goes for, I want a red button and the other says I want a green button just to make it very clear to you what I mean by a conflicting requirement. Well, what should you do? Someone has to put the foot down and make a decision. And this is what I mean by taking it back to the to the stakeholders. You suggest something. Let's go for a red button. You take it back to the stakeholders and there will be a discussion. The one who uh, initially uh, said that, no, I want a green button, will probably argue 
that the button should be green and not red. But now you have something to, to, to relate to. And if a majority of the customers agree that, okay, the button should be green, then you can go back and you update that requirement. But it's a, it's a, it's a complete process here. It's not that you will get something uh, ready to use from, 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 from the, the initial information gathering. You need to process it. There's also another uh, important thing, and that's prioritization. Uh, when you uh, start specifying requirements for a product, it, it's, it's like a promise to the customer that we will, we will give you this. But it's always a great risk that you try to promise too much. And with the process constraints that we have uh, identified, well, for instance, a budget, time, resources, stuff like that, that equation will give you how much you can promise. And if you talk about wish lists, there will be items that are, well, they are good, but they are not prioritized. So you have to put them on some holding list for future releases. Not now, later. So now you have elicited information, you have done the work uh, identifying different types of requirements, you took the uh, discussion with the stakeholders, you prioritized. Well, it means that now you have something that will describe the product to be developed. So now you, you specify the requirements for the product. And when you specify requirements for the product, that's more of an internal communication with the development team. Hey guys, this is what you're expected to develop. You did the work with the uh, external the stakeholders before, they agreed, and now you specify it for, for the development team. Okay, so this, this, this is a fairly straightforward uh, uh, approach, but just a very simple exercise here, just to keep you guys active. It's directly after lunch, so you have to fight to stay awake. Okay, write down three most important requirements for a cell phone. That should take you 30 seconds. Write down three most important requirements for a cell phone. And since you're so young, you don't have to write. You can keep them in your head. <laughs> or I have to write them down. So, what is the most important requirement for a cell phone? To make calls. To make calls? Yes. Something else? Send text. Send text. Internet. Internet. Okay. So this was just a very quick exercise. And we should have asked around more, of course. But I was actually surprised that the first one we got was to make a call. Uh, usually, we never get that. So I was a bit afraid that the second most important requirement would have been to receive a call. But now, it seems like, like at least the, the guys in the room here prefer cell phones where they can call, send text, and have internet. Not receiving calls. It's, 
It's a, it's a very, very simple exercise, but, but it shows quite a lot of the difficulties you face when you go out and ask users what they would like to see in a product. So, if you think about a real project, well, if you just go out and ask customers to come up with their wish list without providing them the feedback, doing maybe some work for them, filling out the blanks here. In, the, in this example, I would have, well, taken the information I got from you, and I would have added received calls, received, well, add to the story. Go back to you and say, hey guys, don't you think that receiving a call is more important than internet? No. We can have a vote on that. So, this is not as simple as it may what it looks like. And if you, in addition, have to, 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 to come up with a specification of requirements that satisfy this little list of properties, requirements should be correct. What is correct? Well, it should be the correct requirements for the group of stakeholders you have for this product now. How many of you have purchased a software product or downloaded a software product where you have been 100% satisfied? Doesn't happen that often, do, do it? No. This is one example where you from your point of view, would have said, I, I don't think that the requirements for the, this product were 100% correct. When you write your requirements, specify them for the development team, they should be unambiguous. Ambiguity is a, is a, is a great challenge. What, what do we mean by this requirement. What does it mean? Does it mean red or green? Left, right, big, small. It might sound easy, uh, quite easy to, to, to write unambiguous requirements, but in practice it's not. Complete. We should have a complete coverage of the requirements for the product. Requirements should be verifiable. It should be possible to test your final product for the requirement, if it's in there or not, if your system satisfies the requirement or not. Then we have consistencies, that is that we should not have one that points in this direction and something that goes in a completely different direction that is like working against each other. We should have uh, consistency in, in our specifications. Design independent and traceable. They, these are, well, uh, properties of the, the specification uh, itself. So, uh, is this possible? Nah, no. I would say no. Not, not there is never such a thing as, as, as perfect. It's good enough, what we're looking for. Perfect? No. Good enough. That's what we're looking for. If we're looking for perfect, it will just cost too much for us and for the customer, and no one will be willing to pay for that, so we have to go for good enough. But requirements engineering is difficult because it involves people. People have their own opinions. We have to communicate different cultures, different experiences. 
backgrounds, etc. Tacit knowledge. You remember, well, can you give the instructions to someone uh, for how to ride a bicycle? The example with the cell phone is another one with tacit knowledge. Well, most people think of, well, it's obvious that the cell phone, you have to make a phone call or receive a phone call. So it can't be that what they're looking for. They're looking for something more special, unique. And if you've been working somewhere and someone comes and asks you, what, have, what are you doing at work? Uh, so many things have been automated. You don't think about them that it's so easy to forget something. Another issue here is, is well, political or different agendas. If you come to a, 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 an administrator and you represent a software house that will develop some IT support system that partially will, well, uh, make the administrator uh, uh, well, out of work assignments. That's not easy. You have to go to and ask someone to describe how they work so that you can develop an IT system that replaces the, the person. Of course, it will be difficult to get the right information from that person. So, why do we model the goals of our system, the requirements then? Well, communication is key here. And we need to find ways to, to externalize these requirements. We cannot keep them up here. They must somehow be communicated to within the development team, with the different stakeholders, Because when we have the models, we have something to relate to. Relate to as a developer or as a end user or any other stakeholder. So, one of the main reasons is to, to be the bridge here between the end user perspective and the developer. We, we can't have all the developers running around talking to the end users. There must be some, some, something that, that, that brings the two parties together. And for that, we use the models. I'm going to try to show you a bit uh, with this little animation here. And I always keep my fingers crossed that it works. But here is one of the reasons, or the main reason why. We have a customer here. Uh, on, on uh, your left hand side and then the customer will talk to the analyst and they will talk, 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 talk and then eventually they will agree. And this agreement will be put into a, 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 a model here. So this model is the agreement between the customer and the analyst. This is the requirements definition process, where you elicit information, analyze information, transform it into requirements that you communicate with the customer to make sure to validate that you have the right understanding, a shared understanding. But next, what happens? Well, now the model should be used for internal communication. And hopefully, the analyst can convey the ideas for the product, the requirements for the products, to the team of the designers, developers, so that they, and you see it's the same light bulb here, they share the understanding with the customer. So the analyst is an expert in eliciting and processing and specifying requirements and communicate them back into the development organization. So 
this traditional perspective has been, well, with more uh, modern approaches like, like, well, agile development, where you have a product owner representing the customer, prepare, writing up the, the, the uh, user stories, etc., doing the prioritization. Well, in, 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 in those settings, uh, this model is, is, is blurred. Uh, it's, it's much more, well, vague in, in just mere contours because, but still, well, the idea to have a, some kind of, well, representation of the requirements communicated to the development team is there. But for many development projects, you will see an approach similar to what you just saw uh, on this slide. So, when it comes to, to, to writing requirements or specifying requirements, uh, the problem is the language. And, and what you saw uh, the other day was that, okay, what type of languages do we have? We have natural language, we have formal language, we have different graphical languages on a scale from not very formal to, to, to like an automata, which is, is, a, is a formalism that you can use for, for, for verification, for instance. So we have something similar here for, for, for requirements. And in order to fulfill, satisfy this list of properties, you have to be a little bit more demanding on the language used. For instance, avoid vague phrases. Around a month, have basic knowledge of. What do you mean by that? Ambiguity. Avoid that. Around a month, how should that, a requirement with that, wording be verified? How can you test for around a month? Do you mean 25 days, 35, 29, 32? It's not precise enough. But writing up requirements in this way, like a list of statements, the system shall, the system uh, will, you don't see that too often anymore because it's so difficult to get it right. And it's also extremely difficult to communicate a list of statements back to the customer trying to explain to them that this is a system we're going to build for you. So instead, there will be other techniques that we will uh, discuss in a while. Another part of the requirements writing that we haven't said too much about yet uh, is quality requirements. So, so functionality, that's, that's pretty well obvious what that is. But if you think about the, the quality of the functionality provided by the system, you come into to, to areas like performance, so how fast does your system respond to some, some uh, when you initiate a transaction? Uh, how much memory does the system use? And these requirements are slightly different compared to functionality. Because functionality, you can often say, yeah, it's there, or no, it's not. So it's more like on and off, zero or one. But a statement like the system shall be fast, what do we mean by that? Well, here we have to decompose our quality requirements into uh, much more precise statements about what we mean 
by fast or secure. And at the end of today's lecture, I will show you one of these uh, decomposition systems that will help you to, to answer the right questions regarding, for instance, system performance. But, but one example for, for system performance is, is uh, what should the average latency be for uh, well, a transaction? So how, how long should you uh, wait on average to complete the transaction in your system? If you say two seconds, well, you know that part of the performance is a statement that says the average latency is two seconds. Now you have something that you can test for, something that is verifiable. So we end up with more precise specifications with less uh, or fewer ambiguities. And as I said before, we also have the, the constraints. Uh, they are also requirements. Implementation, implementation languages, specific hardware, uh, different interfaces uh, to external systems. Uh, packaging, legal aspects, licensing, uh, can be uh, specific uh, instructions, for, say that you're developing a system for a particular domain. Well, for that domain there can be regulations that, that um, puts requirements on how you develop your software. Uh, there can also be requirements on, on, on operations, uh, how, how the system should be deployed, how it should be maintained, etc. Cetera, et cetera. So make use of iterations and increments. And the difficulties can be found in communication, that stakeholders don't understand each other. And how can we agree? and share the same vision with the stakeholders. Well, there's only one way to do it, and that's with iterations, where before we decide to, to, to de deploy something, we discuss it. So, if we look at a more traditional waterfall model, uh, you remember they, in, the, in the waterfall model, the idea was, that, okay, like, let's plan everything up front. And then we have one requirements phase where we finish the requirements. And then we have a design phase where we finish the design. Then we have an implementation phase where we implement everything. And then we have a testing phase where we test the system. Simplistic view. But, but so the idea here was to, 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 well, take a vision and try to figure the system out and specify the requirements, more or less in, 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 in one go. But what we are looking for here is, is, is a stepwise refinement, like the one we, we, we discussed uh, last time, where you have as you understand the system more and more through communication with different stakeholders, well, a gradual improvement of your specifications. So what you have is, is not a direct connection between the vision and the requirements. You work with iterations. You have this, this funnel. And now try to, to, to depict this, this uh, uh, iterative interaction between the stakeholders and, and the analysts, where they, okay, they came up based on the vision, they came up, come up with something that is, ah, oh, broad, but, well, it's something that they can communicate 
but it wasn't good enough, so they went back and they, they refined it, made it a little bit more precise, threw out some statements, took in some other ones, improved the specification, and continuing getting closer and closer to, to the target that describes a system that better matches the goals for the stakeholders. And eventually, oops, you will have a requirements document. So, part of this game here, given that we're developing iteratively, you know, part of the will be to, to not just specify requirements, there will also be development of code. You can have a demonstrator developed that you use to communicate your understanding of the requirements. So it's not this waterfall where you specify the requirements and then move on. It's iterative and incremental. So, what's wrong here? Well, ah, there's something that is on, on the slide, but it can't, it's not, it's not visible on the screen here. Okay. So, iterative and incremental means that, well, you start somewhere, you start with something called the vision. And the vision is, is trying to frame the system you're supposed to build. It's more or less to just to, to, to tell you that, well, you're in the right neighborhood. Not more details than that. And then, you can, based on this uh, vision, start making uh, decisions about, for instance, well, first and, and foremost, if it's feasible to develop this system. What do you mean by feasible? Well, when you talk to your customer, you will get an idea about the system. That's part of the vision. You also get a feeling for what they are willing to, to, to uh, invest. And if you combine the two, you can start to look for, okay, what type of technologies should we use to, to realize this system, to realize this vision? And if it turns out that, well, with today's technology, there is no chance whatsoever that we will succeed in developing this on time with this budget for this customer. Then it's better to say, sorry, but uh, thank you, but no, thank you. We can't give you this in this short time because there is no technology out there today that gives us any support. So we have to start exploring that area, coming up with our own implementation of something. And that means that your budget constraints are unrealistic. So the feasibility study will be a, a first step, more or less a go, no-go decision. So before you start to invest too much into this project, you try to determine if it's, if it's possible or not, if it's feasible or not. If you have a go, you will start working with uh, the functional requirements and uh, the quality requirements. And you can not see the functional requirements. They are here in the use case model in between, supported by the supplementary specifications that, that will give the quality aspect of the behavior in the system. So, you start with the vision. The vision can then be further refined, you know, in the funnel somewhere, into a definition. And the definition 
is primarily targeting the, the functional aspects of the system for end users. And then it's further specified together with the quality requirements. And this package here at the bottom, the specification and the supplementary specification, that's what you will feed into the development organization. So uh, do this iteratively. You will see that we will work with the vision, we will work with the definition, discuss the definition with the customers, go back, refine it, start working with the specification, and in iterations, refine, improve, as we talk to the customer, as we understand the customer, and they understand us. But where it all starts is with the vision, followed by the definition and the specification. So after the break, we will continue and start looking at the vision document. Okay? So see you in 10. Okay, so uh, we started the second half here with the vision document. Uh, something that, well, the first, uh, where it all sets uh, uh, out. Something that defines the stakeholder's view on the technical solution to be developed. So, so what expectations do the stakeholders have on, on the system we're supposed to develop? What's important here is that you don't try to go into details too early. Don't rush things. Focus on the big picture, the core requirements, the, well, the ones that everybody can agree upon. Don't try to go into the nitty-gritty details at this point. Relax. You will get there eventually. When you define a vision, the stakeholders' key needs and features, well, it's actually on paper their win criteria. If you, if you can give them this, they will feel like winners. They will be happy. So take your time to define the vision. There is, well, many different ways to do it. Here's the checklist. I just want to, well, go through it because it's, it's important that you remember that you go take your vision document and, of course, communicate with the stakeholders. Uh, just, for instance, make sure that all stakeholders are on board. If not, someone will sit angry in some office and never feel like a winner because the guy wasn't invited to the vision discussions even. Make sure that everybody, everyone agrees on the definition of the system boundary. This is the system and this is not the system. Keep it on that level. So where do you find, well, a structure for writing up a vision document? Well. You remember the, the unified uh, process, the OpenUP instance of that? Uh, OpenUP provides a vision document, a template for it. And uh, after an introduction, uh, you start positioning in relation to a problem and to a product. So, so here you start with a problem statement. A problem statement that you will try to solve using a software system. So your product positioning statement will say something about how you intend to solve this problem with software. And then you have the different stakeholders you describe the user environment and then the product overview 
with the needs and features for the specific uh, product. And then additional product requirements, you know, the, it could be different qualities, could be different constraints on the product, etc. So the separation of problem and product is, is one way to do it, but, but you can just go for the product. You don't have to, to take this extra uh, problem uh, statement. Just to give you an idea where you can, well, what you can, what you can include in a vision document. But what's important here is that you keep it on a level where, well, you have to further refine the needs and features, for instance, and turning them into requirements. Now it's just about agreeing with the uh, stakeholders that, that, well, this is the system which we're expected to build. Frame that. So, uh, so far, we talked about understanding the problem and how important it is. If, if we don't understand the problem, we will solve something that the customer doesn't want us to solve, and we will not end up as winners. Understanding the problem is, is, is key here, not just for, for uh, uh, doing the right things, but it's also key for planning. You can't plan if you don't know what you're expe expected to do. You must figure that out. So requirements will impact the planning. We also talked about dealing with complexity using abstraction and decomposition. Not on this lecture, but uh, last time. And these are the, the key mechanisms that we will use also to have this stepwise refinement of our requirements when we create the models. We have different types of functional and quality requirements. And we also said something about how difficult it was to find them and specify them. So what we're going to do now is, is that we will take one step into the unified modeling language and look at the use cases and, 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 and see what they are all about and how they can help us to, to communicate with stakeholders to uh, pinpoint the right functional requirements and combined with a supplementary specification, uh, pinpoint also the quality requirements. But if you look at requirements elicitation, requirements analysis, requirements specification, the product we're expected to, to uh, develop will exhibit some behavior to the user. The user will measure a system after its behavior. Is it the correct behavior that I want for the tasks I'm expected to, to, to complete here? If it's yes, well, then the customer will be happy. So when we talk about requirements, it is about behavior. But we could do this either like the system shall do this and the system shall do that, but we should avoid that because it was difficult to communicate in that way with the customer. And instead we should focus on, on system dynamics, the behavior of the system. Because if we can agree on, together with the, the stakeholders, that okay, this is the behavior we want from the system. Well, then we have a very good platform for our continued efforts with design and implementation and testing. So in the UML, you will find support for, for many levels uh, of, of, of behavioral models. Use cases, business processes, and activity diagrams, Use case realizations, 
object life cycle, object to object communication. Our focus will be, be here. Next week, we will say something about object to object interaction just to, to take a step from requirements towards the solution. But, but for now, we just look at, at use cases and how to model business processes. Why? Well, that's where it all starts. That's the communication with your stakeholders. They understand, well, the high level functions in your system, in their system. And they also understand the processes where your system will fit in within their organization. So uh, these are high level, doesn't require a, a 10 week class at university to understand. A use case tells a story. Story, yeah. It's actually something that is pretty similar to, to storytelling. Because if you think about a, a computer system, there are paths through the system. You use the system following different paths. And sometimes you reach a goal, sometimes you fail reaching a goal. And if you can describe how a system or what a system should support in terms of behavior like this, you have a good behavioral model for the system on which you can base the system implementation. So the use cases are performed by actors, and actors can be users, human beings, but it can also be other systems. And a use case has a beginning and an end, and it shouldn't take too much time to go from the beginning to the end. It should be reachable in a reasonable time set. So, these goals here, behavioral goals, is a very good starting point for examining user requirements. Because it's an attractive way of communicating with users. This is how we think the system should work. Do you agree? Yes, no. Are this, is this the right path, or should the path be slightly different? So, how do you do this? Well, a system interacts with the environment. And when you interact with a system, you uh, there is not just one path through the system. Typically, there are several alternative paths. In each path, each unique instance of a path corresponds to a scenario. And these scenarios will be described by use cases. So, so the relationship you will see is, is typically well, one use case, several possible scenarios. I should give you some examples in a while. So a scenario, and I like number three here, an imagined or projected sequence of events. Okay, a scenario, a sequence of events that the system should guide the users through. So, as I said, we have several scenarios that are similar. And we need some kind of abstraction because we can't capture all scenarios, all possible scenarios in a, in a, in a computer system, so we need to to create some abstraction. And the abstraction we use is the use case. So one use case, 
many scenarios. So, uh, one example when you work with scenarios is, is that there are different alternative paths. And the reason why we have a rather restricted uh, duration of a use case is actually that if it takes too much time from start to finish, there will just be too many possible paths that it will be too difficult to, to, uh, to capture them all. Instead, we'll, we narrow it down, it will be more, uh, it will be less complicated to capture them. Scenarios can be captured in, in, in the activity diagrams, the UML activity diagrams. At the end of today's lecture, I will show you the example uh, of how to do that. But just for you guys to, to, to get a feeling for what a scenario is. So, what are the goals for an ATM? You know, the machine you go up to, put in your bank card, enter your PIN code. Well, what is, what is the main goal for this system? To give you money. To give you money. Uh, that's, that's the kid's view. <laughs> Dad, can't you just go and pick up some money? Sure. Unlimited resources. No. Withdrawal of money. Yeah. And possibly also uh, for the poor student at the end of the month, no money on the count yet, oh, another day, pasta. Okay, so two goals. Okay. Think about the withdrawal of money. Can you, can you imagine more than one way of, well, reaching or possibly failing to achieve this goal? What can, what can happen? Where, where does it start? It starts, well, what do you do? You insert your card. You insert your card, yeah? Okay. What can happen? Way. Yeah, that's that's let, let's 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 not maybe we shouldn't start with the exceptional ones. Uh, let's start with the, the with the the, the straightforward uh, scenario. Insert the card. The machine asks you for a pin code. Pop, 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 pop. Correct pin code. Okay. Next, an amount. Pop, 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 pop. Okay. Next, check balance or do you want a receipt or not? Well, no receipt. Check, then it checks the balance uh, with the bank. If you got money on the bank, so to speak, well, it triggers the the uh, uh, hardware to to uh, well give you the money, using your wording, and uh, then you will get your bank card back. Okay. What you just heard was an example of a scenario. So scenarios or stories describe how these goals can be achieved. Based on your own experience, it should be slash wishes. Because sometimes it's a real system, sometimes it's a, a system that you would, well, would like to see. So, you describe how a system is, what it is, descriptive, or you can be prescriptive, describing a system that should be developed. Same technique applies. The system we're going to replace works like this, or we would like a system that can do this for us. That's prescriptive. So, some examples. 
So, so this is when I did some teaching in, 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 in China. That's why it's R&B uh, and not Swedish kroners or euros or whatever. The card holder inserts the bank card into the ATM. It asks for a PIN code, enters our code, code is correct. Card holder selects, this is the scenario we just walked through. Uh, but here we got a receipt, okay? That's one scenario. There are more. Here we enter a different amount. That's a different scenario. This is what I, well, I meant by the abstraction. You cannot describe all scenarios. That would just be just too much. There will be overlapping scenarios. What else do we have? The card holder enters an amount for 50 using the ATM rejects the amount. The cardholder decides to abort. The ATM, ATM ejects the card. So you, you, see, you see that this tool doesn't have a steep learning curve. You, you, can, you can ask users to, to write up these scenarios. And you don't even have to be there. You can just tell them and, and put him at work. But now we have an abundance of scenarios. Way too many. But we have the information because this, this is like a gold mine. You can mine requirements from your scenarios. Because that's the essence of the end users wishes for what the system should work or uh, how the system should function. But now we come to, to this, this abstraction mechanism. And that's the, the use case. Uh, this was not a perfect graphic, sorry for that. But it says a use case at the top and then we have scenarios down here. This is like an instance of. So a scenario is an instance of a use case. So now we have way too many stories. And these scenarios are overlapping, possibly conflicting. And we need this abstraction to reduce, to make it Useful, useful for us as developers. And that's the, the use case. Think of this as, as the same uh, relationship between a type and an object or a, a class and an object. You know, the class describes a, or a type describes a, 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 a number of objects, whereas the object is the instance. It's, it's a similar rela relation. That, that we're looking for a use case to describe the possible scenarios for this system. <coughs> Excuse me. So, so the UML word for, for something that uh, represents a number of other things is a classifier. And if we start looking at, at uh, the use case representing different scenarios, well, what we should do is start grouping the scenarios. And one way to group them is after who is involved in the scenario, which external parties are involved. And, and the terminology here says, well, a use case is connected to one or more actors. So someone or some system that is involved in a use case, involved in a scenario. So what are the actors in the ADM case? Who would you say is, 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 is the principal actor for that system? 
Okay, I'll give you some help. Customer or cardholder or whatever you choose to call them. That's someone who is involved in the most scenarios. You also have the bank. The bank is an external system where you check for, for uh, the account balance before you approve the withdrawal, for instance. Then you can also imagine other actors, you, for instance, some technician here that, that will perform maintenance on the ATM. And, well, the guys from, from the security company that, that uh, fill the machine with bills, they're also users of the system. So how do you depict this? Well, now we want to communi start communicating with, with uh, the stakeholders here. And remember, we had the vision, and now we should still keep it very simple. So we have this naive notation with a cardholder that withdraws money using the ADM. So what can you say? Does this simple model communicate anything? The answer is yes. We should always keep in mind to keep it simple. Because if we start throwing in too many details, we lose this uh, lose the benefits from our abstraction. People get confused by too much information. If they are interested, well, we will provide the information to them. So if someone is asking, hey, that withdrawal, what does that mean? What are the processes behind a withdrawal? Because someone might be interested in what happens if you put in the card the wrong way, or if it's your library card, what will happen? Probably the system should not ask you for the PIN code. So, someone will ask for additional information if they need it. So, abstractions, let's create a hierarchy. The two mechanisms we use to deal with complexity. Well, Underneath that nice little surface that says withdrawal, we will have a complete description of our use case. And there will be details about what initiates the use case. In our case, someone putting their bank card into the slot. There will be uh, pre and post conditions. What is a precondition? What is a post condition? Well, it's a logical expression that must hold prior to initiation. And a post condition is a, is a condition that holds after the completion of a use case. So for this uh, withdrawal, there could be, well, one precondition is that you're a customer in the bank and hold a valid bank card. If, if you don't satisfy that condition, this is not a use case for you. A post condition could be that the new account balance is the former balance uh, subtracted by the amount you withdraw given that you withdraw money and, and you were successful. But besides these starting and end conditions, there is also the flows of events. Remember the trails that will take you through the use case that forms the scenarios. So the primary flow of events for the ATM will take us from entering the card, get the money and your receipt. 
and there will be like no glitches along the road. There will be uh, perfect reading of the, uh, the chip on the card. There will be no problems for you entering the PIN code. You will enter an amount that, well, is okayed by the bank and you will get the money, you get the receipt. No problems. That's the primary flow of events. But then we have all the other alternative paths, secondary flows, as some people refer to them. That's, that's the when something else happens. So anything from, well, alternative paths to, to fulfill a goal. It could, for instance, be that the first time you, you uh, after you entered your PIN card, you, you entered the wrong PIN code. Your bank card and you entered the wrong PIN code, sorry. Okay, you get a second chance. Now you, could, now you well, enter the, the right PIN code and you're back on track again. Okay? There you had an, 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 an alternative path. Okay? But then there you have the exceptional one. And here's, well, your library card or bus card. That's an excep exceptional path. Someone enters the card. The card reader doesn't recognize it. So what should you do? Eject the card, boosh, finished. So we keep the surface simple. Just a blob with a nice little name to it that says withdrawal. Because someone could just be interested in these high-level functions and say, okay, here we can withdraw money and we can get a, 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 a statement for our account. Well, it looks okay. I'm not interested in more information. If you are interested in, interested in information, well, then you have the use case descriptions. So... Brainstorm scenarios start identifying actors and use cases so you can divide them into piles of papers, whatever form you collected your scenarios on. Then you can start to describe the use cases with the primary flows of events, alternative exceptional ones, initiation, termination, pre-post conditions, etc. You can structure, that is more or less just, just create a use case model with actors and use cases. And you can start prioritizing. So, a simple use case process Start with scenarios, analyze your scenarios, specify them as use cases. So here's a chat application and, and I just highlighted with a red box here. New users must register with the server first. Okay. So how can this little goal be achieved? Well, we start with scenarios. There is, uh, well, a description uh, with some nickname, phone number, well, pretty detailed description of the information that should go into to the system here. Uh, then there is, a, a, a at the bottom here, System processes the form and sends out an email with logon information, including a one-time password and a URL to uh, the first time logon page. Okay. Can you see any alternative paths through this one? For instance, uh, Helen here uh, enters 
H-E-A-N as her nickname, what if we already have a user with that nick? Well, alternative. We have to go through some alternative flow, come back to Helen, ask her to give a different nick, maybe suggest a nick, do something else to, to resolve the, the situation. So, based on the scenarios, we can start describing use cases. And start termination, pre-post conditions, how does it exchange data? Well, we can talk about forms, we can talk about user interface requirements. All this ties in very well with this behavioral model. So, the oversimplified description of this use case would look something like this, with the primary flow only uh, on this uh, page. We don't consider any of the optional ones. I can leave that as an exercise for you guys. Uh, we don't talk too much about pre-post conditions or termination either. It's just like, well, a flow. And you can, if someone is interested, you can show them this flow. And this, this is our understanding, is this is the behavior the system should ex exhibit. If you want to look more into the details of a use case description, well, open UP. They will provide you with a template for that too. At least it will give you some idea about, okay, a brief description, an overview description of the use case, actors involved, preconditions, some well details on the basic flow of events, the alternative flows, post conditions, and what they call special requirements down here. Special requirements are user interface requirements, other quality requirements, etc. So from scenarios, identify and describe the use cases. Put all registering scenarios into one use case covering that behavior. So this is, this is a much better approach compared, well, try to formulate the registration process as a sequence of the system shall do this, the system shall do that, the system will do this. That's something that, well, at least I think is not very natural, at least not if you compare it to this. So behavioral descriptions are key here. So we get a primary flow that looks something like this, fills out form and name, submit the registration form, system generates the information, sends out the confirmation email with a first logon, first time logon page URL. Okay, now we have the flows of events. What you've seen so far are just textual descriptions. Text, okay, if it's one, two, three, four, five sentences, but if you have a uh, reasonably sized use case, several possibilities, well, maybe you should look for a more powerful language. Well, language for what? Well, you need a language to express the behavior, but you also need some kind of language to express the uh, special requirements. For instance, the page validates the form in the background. There are some, some UI specifics here with activation and, and uh, deactivation of buttons, etc. 
But what you see often when you do these behavioral models is that, that, that the UI prototypes, the UI mockups are, well, developed together with these models. Because if you have a user uh, interface uh, uh, prototype, and you show that to the potential user, you have something that is very close to, to, to a demonstrator. You can say, okay, here you fill out the information, you press that button, and when you press that button, the information is validated. If it's okay, well, you will go to this page here where we will uh, register all the information and send out the confirmation email. So, so it's very close to, to the real thing if you have the behavioral model combined with a user interface prototype. But textual descriptions are, 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 are limited if, if, because there are all these ifs, else, maybes, different types of, of uh, control structures that, that guides the behavior uh, in a use case. And the UML has this uh, activity diagram that is a perfect uh, example for, well, in here you have events, the actions here, the rounded rectangles here, and in here, you, you specify that fill in user information. Well, here's an interface. Here's some interaction with end user. You have some validation, form validation. If the form validation says fine, you go down here. If not, you get feedback. And the user can modify the information in the forms, come back here, new validation. Eventually, and now just to show you an example of, of the strength of, of the, uh, the system here, uh, the, the diagram type, well, you send out a confirmation email. Huh, this is an asynchronous signal. This little, you see it's a rectangle that almost looks like an arrow on the right hand side here. And it fits very well to this uh, reception of the me me message down here. And then another asynchronous communication and confirm registration that fits perfectly well to the receive confirmation down here. So, so you can, instead of describing that in words, you can use this figure to illustrate and now we can start discussing if this is a suitable notation for end users or if it actually requires a 10-week class at the university to figure this one out. But it's, what you can say is that, okay, we send out a uh, confirmation email and then we go down here to this holding pattern here. And here we have two possibilities. Either, well, time runs out we have a timer, say, like three days. If you haven't confirmed in three days, you're out. We cancel the registration. Otherwise, well, we will receive the confirmation and we register a new user. You can see the, the black dots here represents the termination of the use case. So the flow of events in here covers a couple of possible scenarios. Register, send confirmation email, timeout, cancel registration. And if you have complex use cases, the activity diagrams could be good to just capture the flow, the flows of events. But activity diagrams can also be used to, to, to capture flows of events uh, together with, with uh, stakeholders in, in, in workshops. So you draw, draw these instead of uh, scenarios. But that's a different story. So use cases. Is all good then? No. 
Whoops. Oh, that was. There are some imp problems and issues. It's a highly functional approach. Uh, tend to look for the positive. You tend to forget the exceptional alternative paths. If you go and ask your stakeholders, to, well, what do you do? You get what happens when they do it. It's like tacit knowledge. They, they forget about all the, the, the potholes that you can, you can uh, bump into. And then there's always a risk that, uh, well, the oversimplified view with a blob and a stick man, stick woman, well, it, that's not the best part of it. The good part are the scenarios. That's where you have the, the, the real interesting information. You can use use cases, a structuring principle for your product planning. Okay. For the first iteration, we work with these five use cases. Next iteration, we focus on this use case. Then, the 10 use cases we have left. So, you can use that as the structuring principle. You can also use it during design. You can say, okay, now we design, now we implement the system, and we focus on this use case because it's the most critical one. So, uh, other uses, iteration planning, testing, testing, yeah. I'm going to show you a technique for API testing in a, in a week or two. You know, API testing based on use cases. Because the APIs you, you develop in your products, well, they are implementations of the behavior described by use cases. So, the use cases will, will be the basis for your test scripts. Staff allocation, hmm? of course. You can look at the sizes of the use cases and you can use that as a rough estimate for, well, how much effort you think is required to, to analyze a use case or to implement a use case. And what's the functional side? That's one part of the model. We have more. We talked about use, uh, user interface requirements, how we can just provide a mock-up for that. But then we have others. We have other things, not just the functionality. And the functionality is best described with use cases, but the supplementary specification covers the remaining requirements, ERPS, ERPS plus. So what is ERPS? Well, it's requirements that is not necessarily related to just one function, it can be system-wide. And they are difficult to capture as use cases. For instance, authentication. Authentication is, yeah, that's a use case if you think about authentication only as enter your username, password, check that, okay, you're authentic, uh, you're like okay to enter the system. But authentication is more than that because after you log on to the system, session management, stuff like that. And, and now we start to talk about, well, things that will be unnecessary to specify as, as uh, uh, use cases, because no end user in the world is interested in how the system guarantees that a logged on user is logged on after five minutes and doesn't have to log on every time. They're not interested in that. They're interested in that the system has that quality, but not, not how it's achieved. But they're interested in, in what they get from their functionality. So, again, this is from the OpenUP. Just to give you an idea where you can find guidance, because these guys are pretty easy to, 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 to forget. 
So they will give you, well, ease of use, ease of learning, usability standards, localization. Ask you the right questions so that you can provide answers for what this means for your system. What is the availability requirement for the system? Uh, what is the, well, frequencies of, of failures how, that we can accept for this system? Is it okay if it fails every second day or every two weeks or should it be available 24-7? You must specify this. We come to performance, we come to supportability. All these are difficult to recognize if you don't get that support because you have to ask, you, uh, the, ask the question here. What does this mean for this system? Okay, so this was it for today. And it was just the first scratch on the surface behavioral modeling for functionality. That's the key. Keep it simple because you must communicate with the end users and, and, and other stakeholders in this process. Otherwise, you will not get it right. What you saw the use case models with actors, uh, stickman and the blobs representing use cases, overly simplified. But it's just like a placeholder for the information you have in the use case descriptions. The details regarding quality you have to add to this. You put it in the supplementary specification. So. If I ask you guys now to go home and, and, and specify the requirements for a system, well, you know, start with the scenarios. Write up good scenarios. Then analyze the scenarios. Identify the abstractions, the use cases, the actors. Come up with good descriptions that covers these scenarios. Now you have a good starting point for the continued development. Okay? So uh, that's it for today. So I'll see you guys next week. Bye.